England tomorrow night, people. Win that in the semi-finals. Win that puts them out of the tournament. Andre Adams, New South Wales bowling coach with us. India, we'll talk about first up though, mate. Looking all conquering. South African side, you wonder if they're going to bottle it at some stage. But last night, overnight, they looked really good. Yeah, that's two games in a row. They played really well. Um, and I think I was looking at the game and thinking, I just wonder if that's going to suit South Africa a bit more, having probably just a little bit more used to the bounce. But, you know, the, the Indian bowling is excellent. So um, South Africa played very well to, to get over the line there. And, um, you know, I heard someone say it's Coley's tournament, the rest of us are just watching. Um, so to get him out early and to, and to take control of the game was obviously a key part of the, um, the game plan. They did that and they... They got ahead, so um, New Zealand's played really well, and uh, you know missing out on that game um, a couple of nights ago, there's opportunity for more points and an opportunity to sort of galvanise the belief. But I think um, I think the you know the win um, the other night against Sri Lanka that was that was pretty impressive. Yeah, so India scored 133 for night, not, not great. I mean, you know, 160s or 70s is what we're expecting here. South Africa actually didn't do it easy though. Two balls left, or was that a good managed run chase for you? Uh, look, I think any time you win, um, sort of four down, that's a that's a pretty well managed run chase. I think the threat with India is is obviously if you if you go too hard early, then you get behind, and it's very difficult to um, to get ahead of the run rate later on. So, I thought they managed that pretty well. Um, you know, there wasn't a, a whole heap of panic. Because obviously, you didn't see that. Like I said before, that Indian bowling attack is is excellent. They're, they're probably I thought fifteen to twenty short on that surface with their attack. Um, it's unknown really what what the what the perfect score is in Perth at this stage. It's a it's a relatively new stadium. We've only played it. I mean, we've, we've played BBL there twice with the Sixers. So um, you know, it's it's a it's a stadium that's a little bit unknown, but it's it's obviously very fast and very bouncy. You also saw with the the South Africans um, pretty much similar to New Zealand against Sri Lanka. Top order knocked over, but you know, in comes three, four, and five, and 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 does the job. It's not the first time that we've seen this in this tournament that. It's not your middle order. It's kind of like your lower top middle order are actually being the batters. What I mean, what I'm asking is why? Why is that? Is it is it easier to come in after three or four overs? Is there something happening with the ball early? What? Uh, yeah, good question. I, I I don't really know. I think I think teams are just getting used to, uh, from what I'm seeing, they're getting used to the surface. And there's there is there is a little bit on offer with the new ball. There's a little bit of swing, a little bit of seam, and. That SCG wicket the other night, there was certainly a little bit of tennis ball bounce. There was the odd ball which took batsmen by surprise, and you saw, you know, the looks on the batter's face of um, of, of pure surprise when the ball did bounce off a length. So um, it, it's a surface that, even though it's a small ground, it it's a surface that can be tricky early. Um, for New Zealand's sake, that getting that middle order to to get in and score runs is is crucial from a tournament point of view. You, you need everyone scoring runs so that when it comes down to the wire, because it always comes down to the wire in big games, you, you need everyone being able to contribute and knowing that they have contributed at some stage will give them confidence. Let's look at that New Zealand batting performance then. At 29 for three, uh, when Phillips should have been caught at 29 for four, at that stage, we were in massive trouble. We were in big, big trouble. But obviously he drops it. He goes on. The commentator's curse is brilliant as always. I wonder what that, you know, is whether that's going to cost the Sri Lankans. Was that the moment of the match? Uh, it's one of them. Uh, they they had a you know I, th- I thought the Sri Lankan fielding was was poor, ordinary. Poor, wasn't um, it? You know, yeah, it was it was very poor, and there's no real excuse for it. Um, even even um, Sands dropped a catch, so maybe it was a uh, I mean it was a beautiful night. It was a clear sky, so may- maybe that was a bit of a bit of a um, bit of a problem. But I just thought the fielding was was really ordinary. Maybe that created some panic. You know, when you feel like you're letting the game go, and you watch Glenn just go about smashing a ton after that, and he also. You know, don't forget, he also ran them ragged. Every opportunity to take two, he ran two. Um, he basically batted the 20 overs and ran as fast as he could the whole time. So um, he put them under a lot of pressure, but they put themselves under pressure too. It was, it was an extraordinary innings from Glenn, and, and um, I'm really happy for him. He's a, he's a wonderful young man, and he gives his heart and soul to the team. So he's, um, you know, he's, he's done bloody well. Almost did a Mark Richardson screech there with the old cramp, didn't he? I mean, Massey just, just managed to get off the field before it started getting embarrassing. Yeah, Rigo only had the one hammy cramping, um, whereas Tweaker had, uh, you know, he had both calves and both hammies. I think uh, Guppy said he went for full body cramp. So, um, yeah, he, was, uh, you know, he, he had more of a reason to scream than, than Rigo did. We're not going to let, you know, we're not going to let Rigo live that down. Southie and Bolt, as well as the one-two punch, getting a lot of attention at this tournament, right arm, left arm. Just playing so consistent, these two. I mean, you know, again, I mean, as New Zealand cricket fans, we're all sitting there going, oh, when is this going to end? And 
with Bolt going to the T20. I mean, we don't know how many more matches you'll play for New Zealand, but when these two are on song, it's just joyous, mate. Yeah, mate, they're great bowlers. Also, um, great tacticians. You know, Tim's, don't forget Tim Salvi, um, captain of the team when Kane's not there. So, um, you know, they're, they're very aware of how they need to bowl. Um, they're smart enough. It's not a, it's not out and out pace, which some people have, but they they use their pace as a weapon. Um, you know, their their egos as far as what they what they want to do versus what's actually needed at the moment seems to be very much in check. And they're using Lockie Ferguson very well as a bowling unit. Mitch Stanton is bowling well. He's so he's um, playing his part. So. Um, you know, it's it's a and don't forget, like, there's Jimmy Neeson there hasn't really bowled much, but there's <clears throat> there's there's plenty of opportunity there um, for other uh, bowlers to come in if needed. But with with Salvi and Bolt doing so well, and you know, Lockie and Sands doing exceptionally well as well, it's it's been a it's been a wonderful combination. They do have, which has been a bit of a surprise to not see the Beast playing uh, Michael Bracewell, uh, especially on the surfaces that do offer a little bit of turn. And um, I think it's probably just a match up him versus Jimmy Neesham at the moment. You know, what do they want? If they, if they feel like they need that extra spin option, then um, maybe Michael will come in then. Andre Adams with us, former Black Cap, New South Wales bowling coach. Now, just harking back to something that you mentioned about just the, you know, the state of the Perth pitch. We go to the Gabba tomorrow night against England, and it's a game that... I don't want to say out loud that we probably can afford to lose, but we probably can. We can probably still get there because of the run rate that we've got at the moment. But just, you know, the varying bounce. I mean, Melbourne, what a bugger. We can, I mean, who, who, who knows what's going on down there because we can't get a game and it rains. But the difference between Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and then Perth, it's like you're playing almost in four different countries at the moment. Well, that's that's the that's been the great strength of Australian cricket for a long time. Has been that that variation. You know, the SCG traditionally has turned a lot as as games have gone on, particularly in Test cricket. So um, Australia has that variation. They obviously have you know it's a massive country and they have um you know, the conditions change state to state. The Gabba is is a, you know another prospect, a little bit like Sydney the other night. It will certainly bounce and it will swing. Um, whether it will turn as much early on, I, I, I don't know. It's a it's a very small ground though, so um, batters tend to be a bit braver when the ground's a bit smaller. So um, you know, it's a it's a pretty cool place to play. The the, the main difference with with uh, the Gabba obviously is if it's warm up there, it's quite a suffocating warmth. So um, you know, it'll be whether you can adjust to that. Uh, England have just had an excellent summer, so they they should be well used to. The heat um, well conditioned over the last six months, so um, New Zealand will that, that game will be an, an excellent game and, and pretty evenly matched, I suspect. Okay, we can't afford to lose because you don't want to drop a game, can you? But this is all or nothing for England. If they lose this one, they're going to be gone. No, you you want to beat them because you want to knock them out. Right, <laughs> put them down. Okay, you know they they're, they're a very very good side. There's there's no um, there should be no thoughts about whether we can uh, whether we can afford to lose. It would be a case of let's knock out one of the tournament favourites. Um, you know they're they're a powerful side. They on the given night, it's a, that that lineup they have is is pretty powerful with the bat. So you you gotta you gotta try and take the opportunity to knock them out. If, if this was a you know this was World Rugby and um, the All Blacks were teetering, and there was an opportunity to knock them out, um, one more game you'd, you'd, you'd want that opposition. Um, they'd be they'd be looking to knock them out. So rather than say we can lose this game, um, you don't want tournament favourites. And a, or, or people who have a history of winning tournaments in finals time um, because they just they know how to play them. Can we say at this stage, I mean, a win there, New Zealand goes to the semi-finals. Are, are you are you looking at at, at the at the second group and thinking South Africa and India are the two semi-finals? Uh, you'd you'd like to think so. I mean, they're they're both playing excellent cricket. It's you know, it's up to them now, but. Um, Weather has played a big part, and you know, like I think if New Zealand had had that game against Afghanistan, you'd like to think they would have taken two two points there. Yeah. So, um, weather's playing a massive part in this. It's keeping some teams in, and it's also knocking other teams out. So, um, you know, this, this tournament's got a little a little way to go before we find out what's really going on. And then, I'll be interested to see what um, you know. It's it's a shocking summer forecast, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens come semi-finals time, whether they're full games or whether they're short games, or who that favours.